video rather than the tablet. <laughs> you know, that was uh, sign only. And they have wanted to know some history about the egg stores in Castle there. I believe there were two egg stores originally, is that right? There were two in three. There were three actually. There were three. Mm -hmm. And where were they, Jack? Well, you the one up the horse hill, or beside them behind where Malaga or used to be shop. Yes. That was that's where Q's was first, you see. And then you had Carlin's. Then, then you had Grace's further out, Ferguson Crescent as well, on the left hand side. I remember the the one on the horse hill and our own, and uh, Dale Coyle, a son of Pat, Pat Coyle. Coyle, and he caught his three little fingers on the egg machine and he lost his fingers and uh, they weren't, he wasn't able to get them repaired and the little fellow just had the finger and thumb and it never really came against him at no, all no. as far as I know. He was a lovely little boy. Well, I, I remember those boys, I was at school in Ballyshannon and the yeah. fish in the Abbey, right. the Abbey Cinema, wasn't they? They had a Kelly band in there. That's right. They had and they were lovely dancers too. That's right, Shamus champion dancers. Seamus well, was Killian not in that band? Oh, I don't know. He no, was. I don't think so. I think he was on it at a time, eh? Well, oh, he might have been yeah, because he had a set of drums at yeah. one time. He was so a drummer in that band that time, but it was a children's yeah. band. But back to the, you were saying about the fire in that egg store, Jack. Ah. There was a fire. Oh, Which egg store was that now, mate? That was. Ah, it would have been Cusers. Cusers. They moved down to the bottom of the town. They were up there first. Yeah. Uh, I remember the egg store at the bottom of the town. Yeah. Right, no. Ah, yeah. well, they, well, moved, I, they moved down there to that, about that new place down there, you see, yeah. after the one was burned. Yeah. My father owned the one in Ferguson Crescent, and it was, uh, I think it was like corrugated, wasn't it? It was, it was uh, like a, a corrugated building, and it was uh, just after Burke Sawmill, that's right, and it was yeah. back in off the road a little bit. That's right. And well, then the, the men would go round the houses and collect the eggs from people, and some people brought their eggs in. And then uh, when they were brought in, then they were graded, they were held up to a little lantern, the shape of an egg, and they could see if they were fresh or if they were good or what the quality was. And from that, they were put, it was all by hand, they were put on a conveyor belt. And then they came to a circular, uh, just about the size of that table, where they came round on little cups, and it was automatic weighed at them. And then the, the heavy ones went down one chute, and the light ones went in the other. So they were graded then according to their weight. The eggs that were tested first for freshness and then according to that. So they were put into, there were wooden boxes in those days right. with two compartments in them. And then on that they put a, like a flat piece of cardboard and then the concertina little squares that opened up and were fitted in. The eggs were put in that and then another piece of cardboard and then the little concertina thing was opened again. So there was like a double crate, about the size of a big orange crate. And then uh, the lids were hammered on that and then they had uh, stencils uh, with a, like a shoe brush on two black. And then the, the country that they were sent to was uh, marked out on this uh, eggs and then they were uh, put in that. So um, yes. then they would have had duck eggs and different eggs uh, like that. But you it had was 30 dozen to the case. To the, uh, I wouldn't have remembered uh, now the exact dozen. quantity. Uh, 30, 30 dozen. 30 dozen to the case. Well, uh, yeah. uh, do you allow you to collect the eggs? Or? Yeah, I think there were a series of vans went uh, round the different town lands. And uh, then they uh, would have collected and it would have been, you would have got more money if you brought your the eggs in. Obviously, you see, yes. and uh, because in those days uh, there weren't any pens uh, that you could carry because you needed the ink, there were plain pens, and only very wealthy people would have had a fountain pen, and workmen certainly wouldn't have had a fountain pen. So, when they were doing out the little receipts for the farmer's wives for her eggs, but she was the one that did the eggs, it would have been an indelible pencil. We would have called them purple pencils. Yes. And if you put them in your mouth, your mouth would have been covered in purple. <laughs> but uh, it was they couldn't change. You see, if you wrote down that they got one and sixpence for the eggs, the old money, of course, they couldn't alter that and say you only got so much or you cheated me because if the purple pencil was an indelible pencil, but it was because there were no pens, because we couldn't carry ink round in a van. Can you remember the names of any of the drivers? 
I think some of them came up to the, you don't know that Jack, some of them came up to the poultry store then. My father sold the egg store and then opened a, a poultry store. So maybe Jack could remember that some of the drivers still... Oh, Johnny McGahey would have moved up anyway. Uh, uh, Johnny McGahey was a great stalwart. Uh. He was a very steady, reliable man. And uh, he was there as long as I could remember. Uh. And I think he came up from the egg store. But I'll tell you who she's still alive. What worked in the office was Lily Doherty. Yes. Uh, Lily Doherty's married to Harold Dead Lord of Marciana. And Lily was uh, the secretary. I think she was in the egg store in Bottenship. Sure, and she yeah. moved up then to the to the poultry store before she got married. And yes. then in those days when women got married then they, they didn't work. Uh, but uh, she was a great friend of the family and uh, she would have been one of my earliest memories there. But I don't remember any other drivers for the eggs because I was so young I wouldn't. But I remember being very disappointed one time because sometimes the eggs were chipped. And if people come in, could come in and they could get a bargain, they could get a, 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 some of these very, very cheaply because they were really rejects, but they were still good food and there was a lot of people poor at the time. But my father would have also sent up to the house because there's a big family and we used a lot of eggs. And we heard that there were chips coming and we thought that it was chips out of the chip shop. And we were terribly disappointed to find out that there were chipped eggs. <laughs> So, Annie, Jack, do you remember any drivers? And Johnny McGahey would have been the only driver now. Yeah. I remember who worked remember. on it. They mightn't have had much of a fleet. It was a small enough concern. Uh, we thought it was big at the time. Uh, I remember, but you had Willie Hamilton, the Pointer Hamilton, as they called him, and mm -hmm. this is the poultry store now. Yeah, this is and the poultry store. Do you want us to go on to that, or do you want to stay with the eggs for a while? What, what area it? would you have collected? Oh. What townlands? Every townland. I used to have a list of the townlands because I remember when I was at training college doing a project on the poultry uh, industry in the Castleberg area and I had a list of all the townlands and the ones you mentioned earlier you, I would have seen Scavaherne and I'd seen the Corgreys, one, two, three, four, five and six. Ah, that's right. There were six Corgreys and all up Caliter, all those, every area. When you mentioned a townland I remember seeing it on the on the uh, on this list. Why uh, were the Gark six Vitsha, made? Uh, it, was, I, it was just the farther you got from the town, the Corgreys increased, and the sixth Corgrey was at the border from Donegal. Yeah. So no more Corgreys after that. Corgrey probably means mm -hmm. uh, something. The translation well, uh, from the Irish. Is it true, Jack? The reason the Corgreys were named that there were so many McHughes I living think, there. Uh, I think that, 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 that was a problem. Now. They had yeah. the postman. They had to divide. Uh, the oh, McHugh's. that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no. Uh, I remember uh, like nearly everybody in the Corgi was McHugh, as well as I remember. And Probably uh, uh, it helped yeah. them to separate the different families, to that, know who the postman would deliver. Uh, yes, the first Corgi, I suppose, instead of, I suppose, in a way, they were the first people to have postal codes. Yeah. When you think of it, Corgi 1, Corgi 2, Corgi 3, so I suppose they're ahead of the national postal yeah. authority yeah. that yeah. they were able to differentiate yeah. then with that. Who would have produced the eggs, maybe? Well, it was the, the every farmer's wife had her clutch of hens, and it was her pin money, and the man did not interfere yeah. with the egg money, and that's whatever we luxuries or whatever we presents for Santa or whatever, the woman had her own money, and that was the egg money, mm -hmm. and I think it was it was the, the really the equivalent of the family allowance, like a cottage industry. It, uh. it was a little cottage industry, and the hens were hers. And uh, but they used to try different wee uh, tricks when the hens were brought in. They would have uh, uh, put wee weights on the, the, the legs. And uh. They would uh, uh, throw water on them to be uh. to be to be weighed and I fed them. And, and, and fed them anything to to increase the weight. And could you blame them because there was a lot of poverty That's about right. at the time. And uh, but during the war uh, years, which is World War Two, uh, nineteen. 39 onward it was the poultry industry then and there was a big demand because of rationing in England in England at the time and um, I remember seeing the poultry being sent off to Birmingham and London and Leicester and uh, Liverpool I remember them being stenciled on in the same way as others they had huge wax sheets of paper and these uh, wooden pallets and the poultry was, was very neatly packed. They made their own boxes, by the way. There was a team of people with strips of timber 
and they made the boxes and passed them along an assembly line and the poultry was put into this and then they had huge massive quantities of ice which that's why the waxed paper was there put on top of the poultry the other the wax paper was folded down over and the lids were hammered on and my earliest memory is hearing the hammer uh, as they hammered them off and then the stencil and then Bobby Porter was the man from Ulster Transport in those days it was the Northern Ireland Road and Transport Board and he would have collected the, these quantities of poultry for shipment to England and a strange thing too some of the orders would have come from Jewish firms so they had to be kosher so they had to have a different method of killing the, the birds for Jewish consumption because they had to be bled so they had a special um, way of killing the, the poultry so that they, they bled because as you know the Jews cannot eat blood so uh, they, there was a special had to be handled differently and everything so it was very interesting and at the time you didn't realise it was all part of your going up to see these big things one thing that my father had to do was put in a bigger fridge we had a small fridge just for storing the things waiting delivery but uh, then uh, because of the quantities that were going through he had to build a bigger one which left him very little space for working and he could have made a fortune if he'd gone into the black market but he was so straight that he just it was regularized everything and uh, when you think of it he could have made a fortune if he had so but the ministry inspectors were came pretty often as well and uh, inspected the premises and much went out and where to go because of this uh, it would have been I suppose a crime in those days to to interfere with food production one other interesting thing I must let Jack in on this I'm talking too much okay? uh, was uh, before D-Day it was a, a very big secret the D-Day the, the attack and um, it, my father the, the inspectors came to my father and um, uh, asked um, for shipments to go out uh, at a certain time and because something big was coming up there'd be no boats after a certain date only they weren't able to say what it was and they said that the, the shipping line the shipping lanes will be closed so it sent as much food they didn't want their people to starve you know they wanted the food chain to keep coming but because they needed all the boats, as you know, large boats, little boats, every boat was used for the, 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 the landings and the, and the other thing. They needed all the boats. There weren't any. So they said he had to be out by a certain time, so he knew there's something big coming. So he, I remember him discussing with my mother, and as a child, your ears are six feet long. You hear everything. And you sensed, and he said, there's something big coming soon because they're closing the shipping lines uh, for this and it turned out to be that it was the uh, day, day the attack in Europe and the defence of Europe. Mm -hmm. So the people up around Talitha and Cordray done their bit for well, the war effort? Oh, I'll tell you another thing too, apart from poultry, rabbits. rabbits. Do you remember the rabbits? Uh, my Uncle Joe. Yeah, <laughs> the rabbits. Mm -hmm. Well, how did he get them? Did he Do you want the rabbits? To, you know, no, 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 they caught them in the fields. How did he get the rabbits, Jack? Uncle Joe used to cycle away to the Cordray's. Uh, I remember them. On a bicycle, I remember him coming home, and uh, the jump shot hunter would have been a driver. Oh yes, yes. Balbo, just living down now. Yeah. Uh, with us in Falkirk, but he was in Masterton's van at this stage. Right. And Uncle Joe go away for two or three days, and Eddie Lafferty and shot hunter would have been around with the grocery van, and he used to send the rabbits down to your father. That's right. With on Masterton's van, and then whenever he came home, I remember him coming, and they were hanging on the handlebars, they were hanging That's on right. the bar, they were hanging in. everywhere. Yeah. He killed them with the dogs and a ferret. Tied by the legs and then uh, slung on the... Yeah. Uh, and there was a period too during the war where the crows went as well. Crows? Oh, uh, I don't remember that. Oh, uh, the crows went too. I don't think we, yeah. we exported the crows. Uh, well, the crow went for, I remember Tom Eric just them shooting them and the pigeon. The crow and, yeah. the, the, crow and the pigeon both went now during yeah. the war, you know. Well, understand. maybe, unless you're an expert, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, no, you probably would get less and, mm -hmm. and some shot as well in your mouth. Well, uh, but what happened there as well in the egg in the egg trade now it would have happened with us at home. Um, we had McAnese. Yes. Come, the grocery man. And uh, 
the eggs would have been two, three cases of the eggs, whatever it was, was given to McInnes. And then they probably sold to your father again exactly. then. Possibly, yes. But the, yeah. the eggs in our house at home, and I would have been used to pay McInnes for the grocery bill. Yeah, that was a, there was a kind of like a barter system too, ah. wasn't there? Ah. In exchange for ah, the groceries. Uh, the groceries ah. they would have got. Uh, and in those days, in a way, uh, um, a chicken dinner, you know, chicken was absolute luxury. Uh, people would have boasted if they, it would have been like a real big occasion when people would have had roast chicken. And when I see the supermarkets now, and it's the cheapest form of food, I think now it is very, very cheap. Um, that uh, I often look at it and think at one time uh, that would have been a luxury meal. Roast chicken would have been a luxury meal. But the turkeys at Christmas was a big thing. They were seasonal in those days because. Uh, uh, they didn't have the forced rearing yeah. the way they do now, so um, the I think that was the um, the luxury <coughs> the luxuries in the farm came from the turkeys. But uh, they were hard to rear. You used to hear them saying uh, turkeys, weren't they? You found a lot more people on too at that yeah. time. I remember Danny Gallagher. Oh, that's right. Everybody came in from the pocket. Uh, Danny the, Gallagher and Eddie Gallagher. They they been. That we'd have been going to school, you'd have been looking across from school yeah, yard at it, you know. And they, they, there was a, like a square area with seats on it, and, ah. and uh, they all sat and uh, the caps uh, ah. on them, and everywhere the dust and fluff of the ah. of thing, and they plucked and plucked and plucked and plucked, and the, the, the feathers got higher and higher. And a firm called David Spain from Derry bought the feathers, it was part of the. Of father's business was the selling of feathers and it was always export or sent up to Derry to a firm called David Spain. Or I was it Spain, Spain. Yeah, yeah, David Spain. And he used the big feathers, you know, the turkey and the goose feathers and so on like that, to make jewellery. Because I remember one Christmas he sent down some of these pieces to my mother and they were made from feathers. And another thing too in school you brought over uh, the turkey feathers tied with a string or a piece of cloth for the teacher to brush down the school fireplace yeah, and the quill, the, the, uh, what is the wing, the goose's wing too was used for in farmhouses for dusting the uh, tray for making scones. Right. They, when they took it out of the oven the, the woman would have brushed it with a uh, goose's wing. That's right, yeah. and, um, so the later years, they changed the method of um, of plucking. They had to um, dip the animal in, or the bird into boiling water, and then my father invented a machine for plucking these birds. But uh, he wasn't pleased with this because they lost the feathers. That part of the business went. Uh, went with that but I think it possibly was because of the health of the pluckers Aye. you know in those days there wasn't that uh, element of it but you could see it getting higher and they took in as you say a lot of uh, extra help Aye. at, um, like for maybe three, at before, maybe three weeks before yeah before it and they, they plucked these and the feathers Aye. got higher and higher and the bales going out That's right, uh, yeah the bales going out any other countries apart from England they exported the uh, well you see they, they couldn't because of the war they yeah. you know and then I suppose they were perishable enough I don't doubt oh Scotland uh, sorry Scotland of course Scotland I don't know about Wales now uh, uh, because now I was only just primary school child at that time and you just kind of mm. I'm only now realising how much I did take and they didn't even know I knew mm. anything mm. about it there would have been a lot of eggs smuggled that Particular period as well, yeah. you know. Uh, there, there's a song about um, Polly Arney where the smuggled eggs are laid. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, that's a good one. Uh, there's a man by the name of McGrannan uh, wrote it, I think. Uh, and a man by the name of uh, Mickey Gallon, Paddy's father, uh, somewhat. That time they used, to go, the uh, they used yeah. to go around and tell it on a, what they call it, tillage. Oh, that's right, the tillage men. Uh, uh, and uh -huh. I checked and I was up a hair and some, some woman and he went to this woman and she hadn't been involved in the smuggling but she had say maybe 200 hens yes. and she had so many eggs over the period mm -hmm. and uh, I said tell her you're not feeding your hens as well as Mrs McHugh for she has only 30 hens and she has three times more eggs than you. <laughs> 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 
Först må gå dig som du ser. Vet du, det sitter det bästa lägen här som är det. Eh. Det var simpler times. Yeah. All free range. But, but, but the winter grace is your father sold. I think it was Gracie's that uh, he sold that and then moved up to uh, to the other that, store. That was across the road from Harden's uh, shop. We lived, uh, we lived in, uh, uh, not where the credit union is first, it was the house along the, the Cleeter Road, just round the corner from that, uh, uh, just opposite the sawmill. And then uh, Uncle Willie moved down to the market bar and then that house then became vacant and then we moved into that. I have a notion it was just around about that time in 1930, 1939 or so, wasn't it? Harry Dillon moved on to the other one then, didn't Harry Dillon moved into our house, that was still our house, and then we took our name with us, Stella Maris, Star of the Sea, after Our Lady was the, was the name of that house, and there was a picture of Our Lady uh, as Star of the Sea holding the child in the porch of our home, which is now the Credit Union uh, offices, and that was Stella Maris. Before that, it was known as Junction House because of the corner. And at my mother's funeral, I was speaking to Con O'Donnell, and Con was saying that when he was at school, he remembers stone being brought from the Scrahi Quarry, which was all owned by my grandfather, yeah. to build that house. So that he remembers that house being built there. But it was kind of changed before we went into it. Yeah. It was modernised with bathrooms and. You know, those kind of things on it. What was your grandfather's name? Willie. He was William as William well. William Carlin. He was William Carlin as well. And your mother's name? Uh, my mother's name was Jessie Healy. Mm. She was from Scotland. Yes. And uh, she, she, her, her father was one of the firms that imported the eggs. Her father was from Fermanagh and yes. he settled in Glasgow. Same as himself. He's from yeah. Fermanagh too. Yes, well, he was from Edirne, from outside of Lurgan Boy, and he emigrated to Glasgow and set up a series of what they call bacon and egg shops. He had a chain of, of, of um, provision shops, and he imported from William Willie Carlin, uh, grandfather, and uh, during the summer he would tour around all the places that exported to him. So he came to Castle Derg and uh, he was visiting Carlin's and my father had done Loch Derg, he'd just come off the island and was sitting sleeping at the side of the fire and my mother and her father came in to greet the, their suppliers and she spied this fella sleeping and she fancied the look of Dan Carlin sitting sleeping after Loch Derg mm -hmm. and she said he was anybody's fancy at that time, he was dopey. And, um, so that was the beginning of a romance, so the eggs brought a romance into it that uh, they fell in love and uh, I think it was Auntie Maggie said, will you stay a couple of days? Those days you stay at holidays in anybody's uh, house, didn't you? Uh, uh. So uh, he went up to Edirne to his uh, sister's house for the rest and toured round and she stayed for a while and in the end he had to come and fetch her because she was so fond of Castle Derg and Dan Carlin that she wasn't going to come home. So they were married in 1929 and had ten children. What so are they, that their was names? the end. Nula, Abby, Mae, Patty, Harry, Liam, Anne, Killian, Una and Frank. Of which I am the third. Interesting <laughs> story. So that was the tail of an egg. Tail of an egg is right. Uh, and the romance of it. Yeah. I remember us we used to go over the wall. Over. My Johnny Murray would have chased it, we wouldn't let you in. Mm. John Murray always wrote it, he wouldn't let you in the door. We really want to see them pluck in, you see. Yeah, he loved watching people work, and I spent yeah. my childhood doing that. We had a forge across, Robinson's Forge, and I spent hours standing watching. I would know exactly how to make a horseshoe now, and I could, I could, I, I think I could yeah. put a shoe in a horse. I, it was every day of my life I saw horses being sh uh, shod and uh, ploughs being fixed and ploughs around the school, ploughs, yeah, reapers, everywhere. harvesters, you yeah. name it, it was there. And the things for cutting turnips and yeah. all were all there to be fixed. You owned that forge? It was Robinson's, Robinson. George, George. George Robinson. George Robinson. And uh, they were great neighbours and uh, they uh, big strong men in the department. And one time a wasp stung my thumb 
And old George, the father, he squeezed out the... And there was a cure for warts. If you put your hand into the, the water, then the iron was uh, cooled. Uh, there was a cure, for, supposed to be a cure for warts. So that was Robinson. So we had a saw, we had a forge beside us, and we had a sawmill just around the corner and an egg store there, and everything was happening just as you. Uh, everything was made from source at that time. Man in across the road with all the flies for the fishing. And I'll tell you, yeah, Neil McDade. He yeah. made the flies. And uh, Joe McCrossan was a saddler. Sadler. He's my godfather. He stood for me. He was next door to us. Ah. And he stood for me and he made the most beautiful uh, uh, harness. And Bobby and, Douglas. And Bobby Douglas worked at the back of the shop and he to the front. And they had ro beautiful rolls of lovely check material for the inside of the horse collars and the donkey collars and uh, then I can see him yet making the wax end he took the he put it in a hook and then he had the wax and he blackened the thing and sewed with two needles and a, a prop and he made everything from source how did he make, what did he make the wax end out of it? I think like a string a, like a, wasn't it it was like a, a hard nah. string and then nah. he got the black wax and he pulled it and pulled it forever and a hook, and put it round a, a hook, made it into a black string, and that was for sewing the harness together. Uh, I think it was a book, was a book called or hemp or something like that. I think it. it was a special hemp uh, or a special uh, material for that. So just round when you were growing up, you, you there was no such thing as ever being bored. You you had factories really uh, round you. You, you, you had the saddler, and then when you go in, Uncle Joe would have said uh, he'd make something, and he always made you a wee whip. Uh, he got some of the cut off leather and a little piece of thing and nailed it for you and he said there you are daughter there's a whip and you had your own wee whip uh, and, uh, who owned the, the timber uh, Burks there were people called Burks there were Plymouth Brethren uh, yeah. people and they had another brother lived out Side where us. Charlie McGraw lives out didn't uh, they live no, out, Side us. Oh. out of Clare didn't no, they no up Cattle Gore up Cattle Gore ah up Cattle Gore and you turned across ah. and but you died on Bigger Bitty again yeah or Bobby Bobby ah. that's right he Bobby had Martin. very clever children. Uh, Ernie. Uh, uh, Ernie was the son. And, and uh, Hazel, or no? Pam. Pam. I want to call the other one. They went to Sylvia. the academy. They Sylvia. went to the academy and uh, they were extremely clever children. Uh, Sylvia. Yeah. So b back to the other Burks, they, they lived opposite us and they brought, literally brought in the tree trunks. And they came out either as planks, either they were, they were rough or they were, or they were Sanded. and they had you got, went in and you saw a tree arrive and you saw them uh, cutting them into the strips and they also were furniture or cabinet makers and they made furniture because uh, even until like my mother's death which is not long ago she would have had some of the furniture that they made uh, they made bed heads and they made tables and they made different things like that and uh, Granny Burke was very good to her when she came first. She was lonely away from home, and when she had Nula, the first child, Granny Burke would have come over and helped her to bath the baby. You know, she'd have been a nervous and new young mother, and uh, so she. And then we had the only telephone in the area, so that everybody would have. Uh, remember one time, Jim Burke. They always got their calls to our house. Jim came over for a phone call and it was the old fashioned phone where you hang on the hook. So when he was finished, it was on the hall stand in the hall, and when he was finished, he said bye bye and he hung it on the coat hanger. So of course the phone was still off and nobody could phone in. And, uh, and then, so it was great because all the phone calls would have come through. Our number was number three. So the, 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 the post office was one, the barrack was two. And we were three, and later on they put two o in front of it, so two o one, two o two, and two o three. And I think Doctor Leary might have got four. I don't know, but we would have been the first telephone in that in that part of the world. And far to down, you had the tailor. You had. Right, Wharton. Wharton. Ah. He was bespoke tailoring. Ah. He had written above the door. <laughs> and I remember my sister being measured for John Purse one time, and he was so. Uh, puritanical or, or respectful of her that uh, instead of he didn't want to measure her size uh, so he got her to sit in the seat and then he, <laughs> measured, he measured the width 
of the seat when she got up. <laughs> he marked out before he didn't want to put the step. Uh, <laughs> he was most. <laughs> well, well, was he a show jumper then or what? Um, oh, uh, uh, or a horse? Um, uh, horse she was, surely. So mm -hmm. she was great rider uh, herself and Uncle John. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, those that had to were all into the horses. And she and, rode in Dublin. And went to school in my way. Aye, so she did, didn't uh, she? In Lockery. Aye, in Lockery Agricultural mm. College. Uh, and, uh, and then you had McHugh's Bicycle Shop as well. McHugh's Bicycle that. Shop, that's right. Uh, John McHugh and Huey McHugh. Uh, and Jim, who was on McHugh. Uh, and then they had they had two daughters, me and uh, Kitty. Kitty. And Kitty. And they, they lived there too. So they had you had the bicycles too, and you could see them. In, I did everything there. Uh, I fixed the punctures and the. Uh, there we go. Are we finished now? I think this is nearly nine o'clock. Mm. That's John McHugh. No, John McHugh's not in that one here. John McHugh did play football. Yeah. And he was a footballer. So there you are. God only knows. Did you ever get anybody to tell you about uh, Charlie Bond? Uh, no. Santa? Never, he never heard that story. Never heard Charlie Bond. Santa. That's John McHugh, oh, now, mate. John McHugh. Oh yes. One day I was up at the grave and his wife spoke to me. Uh, oh, 1996. 66. Or 66. That's, that's this boy here. Oh, would you look at that now, you young face. Huh? That's myself. That's you. Uh, oh, gee. Look at that. That's by Sean O'Connell. The good uh, dairy footballer there. All right. No, that's myself again now. That's oh, Henry McGold, the kid of my niece. Boy. Away. That's, that's John McHugh's son there, yes. and uh, that's another son of John's. The very late. And that's Jareth Ramsey. Very late. Remember, oh, yes. his, mother, his, mother. his mother was Ina Lonnie, she worked in Mays. I know Ina Lonnie well. Uh, she was a the Lonnies were beautiful uh, singers. She worked in Auntie Mays uh, for years. Uh, Auntie Mays for years. They could sing like birds, the Lonnies. Uh, beautiful singers. Yeah. They great collections of songs. Yeah. So there you are. I hope that helped you or whatever. I better talk to you better here for um, nine o'clock. Huh? Do you remember um, the Lita show, Maeve? I was only at it once now, but the rest of the family would have. Uh, you'd know more about it than me. No, I think uh, I Anne never would have. Uh, Anne would have ridden at it. I remember going up once and walking round, but it was only boys we were interested in. We weren't too interested in the livestock mm. and. Mm. And and the Aberdeen Angus not showing more than two front teeth or whatever they used to have on the programme. Uh, but uh, it would only be just to see the only boys about. But, uh, <laughs> I would know very little. We'd, we'd, somebody have been, else we'd have been going for the same purpose only in a different way. <laughs> I would <have> imagine <laughs> that there are people who would know more about it. So, you know, I, I really, to be honest, couldn't say much well, there, about There are no blacksmiths in Castle Derrick now, Jack. Do you remember how many were? There was one out of Spamont there. I don't Robert and Bard Spamont. And there was one off the Cleeter Road at the Milestone. McGlynn's. McGlynn's. And you had the Sproles and Kim. And the Sproles and Gavitia. Well, I'll tell you also, we had that man McGlynn made carriages. That's, that's Jim McGlynn now. Jim McGlynn, down uh, the lane. Aye. So, I mean, you had all in the town, like, didn't they? He oh, made, that's he was a, That's Rogan Tommy. Uh -huh. Worked. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. Made wheels and, and traps and things. Ah, uh, he did it. Man, he made that there. Showed, showed him that photograph. Showed him here. Showed him that he made that. That long, 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 long time. Oh, yeah. Long, long time since you were seeing man of the year. You know, Uncle Willie would have been one of them. That was Uncle Tommy's funeral. Yes, aye. I, I, you were showing me that about the hearse. Right, yeah. But he would have made this uh, type of thing. Any kind of carriage. Uh, he would have made gigs and traps uh, and. Uh, all kinds of. Probably Tommy made a bit he, was a that, you know? he was a wonderful. He was a wonderful. His stuff was very, very uh, professional. It was perfection. The, perfection. Um, uh, some of his daughters are. They're married to Charlie McGill. Uh, my, uh, Kathleen. Uh, another one. Peggy. Isn't she Kathleen Midland and Peggy, Peggy was married McGill. to McGill. She was married to a different McGill. One was uh, McHale and the other was McGill. Uh, she lived in Oma. She separated. And, and Rosalie. She's the one up the Chapel Road there now. Yeah. One of them houses That's up the Chapel Road. Uh, Peggy, one of them. Peggy. But that was their father, and he. He was a wonderful craftsman. Um, I believe he oh, made the uh, caravans for the gypsies. Oh, I don't care, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my Uncle Tommy would have been into making them as well, you know. Yeah. He served his time with them. 
We got a, my lovely uncle Tommy started to work with him at half a crown a week. Not really to wait. Half a crown a week. Half a crown a week, yeah. And, um, Jack, before we go, will you tell us something about the football? Just a little bit of GEA. Well, you want to speak that no, way? No, no, stay here. Sure if you, no, stay here. Because I need um, to see. Well, it's from, it down the from road. our first, um, yeah. would have been 1932. Yeah. No, it was the first start of it. And you had, um, you had George Dunn. You had Eddie McShirley. Right. Eddie McShirley, Paddy Foley. Uh, my grandfather. There were two John Lynch's, my grandfather and my father. And Tommy. And uh, the Masterson would have been to the fore on it as well. And then Paddy Darnley came as well. And um, there was somebody else involved in it too that was teaching the school. Uh, Master Cohn, I think, might have been involved. And it as well. Where, where, where did they play football, Jack? Well, it'd been all, but it was either Mr. Vines or McHale's. They would have been either the two places, man. Where's Mr. Vines Well, um, that's up there now. That's where that team there was. That, mm -hmm. um, that's where St. Eugene School is now. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, one I remember, the GA field I remember, was up till Crow. Ah, that's where the school is, you see. That's where St. Eugene oh, no, School is. No, 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 farther up. Oh, McHale's. Uh, was that McHale's ah, field? Uh, that would have been McHale. Yeah, that was the GAA pitch. Ah, that would have been McHale's. Mm. I think the fact that soccer was also played kind of, uh, um, I won't say divided, but that the talent was spread. Ah. And in those days you couldn't have played both. No, when you see uh, there, uh, there, you would have yeah, a, you John, had some, John McBride. Yeah, some of them had, would have been soccer players. And Jimmy Lafferty was popular. Jimmy Lafferty was just supposed to be two of the best. Yeah. Outside of the two Macanees. Uh -huh. they were supposed to be the and next, they played soccer too. They were supposed to be the next two best soccer players in the town. Yeah. And Molly Coy, right. the postman. See, I think for that reason that like, the like of I Iron and those other places would have had a, a more a tradition of GAA, of, of Gaelic. No, well, I Iron there. hadn't. Now, Have um, not? No, there was a team, there was a team in Gatlin a long, long. Was there before that? I've got I played in the first I Iron one now. Yeah. Uh, I remember our first match was against Gordon. Well, did, it, did it win and then well, come well, back again? Well, I mean, it wasn't gold. Uh, uh, I think there was, there was a, wasn't there a time when there wasn't and then they brought it back again? Uh, that, was, that was at home now in the yeah. town. Yeah, in the uh, town. I'm talking um, the town now. Uh, 32 it started and that's 36, you see. Oh, right. That's right, 62 right. years ago. Yeah. They're not, one of the, they're not one of them people living there now. Just not that one photograph. of them? Not one. Just in that photograph. Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, Dennis Masterson would have been the last, I think. Yeah. Died in Dublin now. Uh, it's and, not that uh, long dead now. Well, the Lynches were involved with football from the earliest days, from, from the early, from the very start time. Uh, no, it still continues up uh, to the present. And that's uh, their own team. Ah, uh, the present time. Well, some of the best known players. Well, again, you have, at that time you had uh, Eamon McShorty, but Eamon McShorty did goal for Tyrone, I think. Big Eamon. Your brother right, Bryant. Right. Big McShorty. Ah, I think he did goals now for Was Brian Tyrone. Was Brian ever played with the uh, team? Frankly, did might have been the minor team. Yeah. Might have played now. Might have been the minor team the year only won the minor championship. Any yeah. other Lynches involved with the county team? No, oh, well, you see, you had Charlie and you had Charlie and Francie, Colin, Martin, as well. And then later years you had John. John. Of course. Uh, present time you have Aiden. One of the stars of the county minor team. Uh, um. I believe you had a, a story of a man who was involved in the very early days of the GEA who was a native of this area. Castle Dug, down, down by the cruise. No, I that was um well he was one of the four very first to the vice first vice president of the GA and when it was founded in eighteen eighty four. He he was the son of a Methodist clergyman, at um a John Houston Stewart. Yes. His father was a clergyman, Methodist clergyman at the crew. Yes. He was a teacher in Dublin. Mm -hmm. He became involved with the GEA? He became in, in, involved with the GEA. Rose to high position? Uh, uh, well, he was one of the first there were four vice presidents, and he was one of them. So, Cassidy Egg was involved in the GEA from its foundation. That's through, right. through him, you know. That's the story you know, I wouldn't have known about. Nah. You know that, mate? No, I didn't know that at all. No, very interesting. I didn't know that, no. Uh, John Houston yeah. Stewart. Was another man involved with the GEA? Jack, uh, was he secretary of also council? Did he live in Lippard? Harry Carey. 
This is a list of some of the old houses in Castle Derg and belongs to Mr. and Mrs. John McHugh, Castle Finn Road, Castle Derg.
A list of those who lived in Micaiah's court at this time 